to make ends meet or to, to start the business and so forth. So one of the things that we've done, uh, it's important for entrepreneurs when they're starting off to recognize that success is not a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, that's the net net is it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It is not a do this and get that and then take this and then do this and then do this and then take that and then do this. That's not how it actually works. You know, and a lot of times we think it's this natural stair-step progression and it's really not, uh, it, it, it is not. So in fact, what actually happens much of the time is, is we end up with um, uh, something that is all over the place. And that's why you have to, you know, society has kind of summed it up by saying, trust the journey, but it's not so much trust the journey as it, in, as it is trust the author of the journey and then make sure you are plugged into you know, his way of thinking there, uh, divine thinking, because uh, it's too, there's too many things going on that you can master for yourself. You can't, you know, one of the mistakes I made earlier on was I realized I had a skill that I could make things happen. Well, in business, that sounds really good. Uh, hey, you can go make things happen. But, and after I made some things happen, I realized that that was actually as much of a detriment to me as it was a skill. Because sometimes, because I can make things happen, I could also make the wrong things happen, right? And then mm -hmm. they hurt, uh, or they hurt others. And so I had to be very careful. I remember the 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 day that it, uh, or, or the time frame that it dawned on me that I could take most any product or service and make it a success globally. I remember whenever I first realized that I had that skill or power. And it was very sobering because all of a sudden I had never really cared about the product of the companies I worked for up until that point. I was just happy to have a job, you know, and, and provide income. And if I had to sell this or sell that, I would sell this or sell that. Uh, whatever the company's product was, I thought that was normal. But then I started realizing I had to be careful what products or services, uh, what, what, the, what company I joined, because the problem, the good thing is that I could sell it. The bad thing was that I could sell it. So, uh, you really have to look inside and you looked at, you look at your ethics, you look at your own uh, integrity um, and value system. And then as an entrepreneur, you're making decisions based on your values. Now you don't hear this in a lot of business schools. Uh, you, you just think you start a business and you focus on ROI and you, you focus on the partnerships and the operations and the distribution and sales and marketing and branding. And, but, but, but you got to back way up. You got to back way up. Uh, and, and figure out what is it that you want? What is it? Why are you doing what you're doing? And, um, and so I think it's critical that you understand that uh, business is not a one-to-one -one ratio. And that confuses people. That confuses people in the United States even. Uh, so and what I mean by that is that uh, what happens oftentimes is people uh, will uh, uh, you know, they will, they, they will do something and then they think that they'll have the logical progression the next year instead of understanding that it's going to, there's going to be an ebb and flow, a natural ebb and flow to all of this. Um, and so I think that is critical to understand that the, 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 the ratio will not always be a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, in fact, rarely is, is it a one-to-one. -one. Uh, so for example, let's, uh, let's take, um, Many of the things that I've done in life did not follow the logical progression of promotion. Um, you know, you think because we've been indoctrinated with the corporate world model of you, you pr get promoted to supervisor, then you get promoted to manager, and then you get promoted to director, and then to vice president, and then to president, and then CEO or board, board of directors. Uh, and there's this logical progression that they talk about. However, uh, what I find as much as anything is that um, uh, it's not so much about that um, as it is that you are all in whatever it is that you're doing. It is about becoming excellent in what you are doing. And as you get uh, th that process of becoming excellent in your area of focus uh, is what leads to other things. There was probably two or three years, maybe even more, but I was conscious of it 
for about two or three years where it seemed like a lot of the things I was doing, I knew I was supposed to be doing them, but they were, they seemed disjointed. It actually looked like I wasn't focused and that really bothered me. And so I remember, uh, you know, making sure that to stay focused, um, I would, I would focus on these, uh, on the, the various activities I was doing. Maybe it was an event over here. It was on this initiative. It was this uh, industry. And then also this industry and they weren't necessarily complementary industries. And so that was, that bothered me. That was troublesome to me. And, um, uh, and so what I realized quickly was that I needed to, I, I wanted to be focused. So it was a matter of how can I be focused and, and what I realized that I had to do, what, and it's not right for everybody, but it was the right situation for me because people try to say, okay, well, he's an author because he's written some books. Oh, he does speaking, so he's a speaker. Well, I don't, didn't want to be a speaker. Uh, uh, or he does, he, he has this, you know, he's into artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Yes, I enjoy that. Uh, but uh, also promote, you know, human rights and obviously uh, women's empowerment, uh, uh, in, empowerment uh, uh, and, you um, and, and, and mentorship for men and for women and boy children and girl children, uh, girl childs. And, and so, uh, and then my passion, I love entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Uh, and so uh, helping, helping people, uh, you know, starting the International Down Syndrome CEO camp. So helping uh, individuals with, uh, th that have Down Syndrome to start enterprises. Uh, you know, so those are some of the, some of the things, but I needed an overarching uh, brand, a wrapper for what is this and why are we doing it in this way? And so a brand can do that for you. Uh, and then it also allows you to be focused because everything is contributing to certain things. It's promoting entrepreneurship. We know that everything that, uh, that we're doing is promoting entrepreneurship in terms of, of the Down Syndrome CEO camp, in terms of even helping women in business, helping men in business, helping what we're doing in Africa, helping children start businesses uh, and kind of get that entrepreneurial spirit and creative energies and juices flowing at an early age. So I think that uh, when you start to look at it, yes, there are some tangible outputs, outcomes, uh, such as cybersecurity technology or artificial intelligence labs, just fun, uh, you know, really interesting work. Um, but it still is just an outcome. It's not the focus, it's the outcome. And so people confuse the outcomes with the, with the process or the focus, okay? Don't confuse the outcomes with the process. You have to focus on the process. Uh, I may have books, but that, I'm not, I don't sit down to write books to write books. Uh, it's to save time. It's so that I don't have to meet with people every 30 minutes if they want two and three hours and I could only give them 30 minutes. I still don't have enough time to meet with everybody that wants to meet. So uh, it's a very impractical way. So really books became a way to become more efficient with my time and energy. Uh, it is very exhausting having meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, especially when it's a different person uh, and you have to start over and it's new relationship, new relationship, not just meeting and information. And so uh, it, is a, it is a more effective way uh, to communicate through write, writing and speaking. You can reach a larger number of people and impact their lives uh, without uh, having to exert all of the energy for relationship. Uh, so to that point, uh, just recognize that sometimes you make your money here, uh, you build your business here, and then you take those profits and proceeds, and then you're able to do what you want to do and build what you want to build and go where you want to go and that kind of thing. And that, my friends, is the essence of what I'm talking about with focusing. And that's what I want to see, uh, uh, see, especially the African enterprises do. They struggle so much with focus. And there is an unduly pressure uh, put on African enterprises for immediate results. That's nonsense. That is utter nonsense in business. In fact, all that does is encourage, encourage cheating. It encourages uh, bribes. It encourages corruption. Uh, and it ultimately leads to failure. So um, uh, instead, of, instead of just focusing on some of the big results, 
what's more impressive is the disciplines and processes that an enterprise has put in place. All right. So, uh, and the hardest thing is self-restraint so that you don't think that I have to make my money in the area in which you want to really work. You may need to start, you have to start where you are with the resources you have or what, or that you don't have. And then as you grow in that area, you can take that into where you eventually want to be. The most common mistake that I see African enterprises make is what there, you know, if there's one steps one through 10, most of the African enterprises want to start on step seven. You know, they don't want to go through these stages. They want to skip it and get to this and that, but without realizing that this is the beauty of the process. And, and, and it's not just for the sake of process, it's because that is, I, I just cannot overemphasize that it's about building the person, entrepreneurship and creating brands that last is just as much about building the person as it is the company. That's why a lot of brands today don't last. And uh, some of the most popular brands that we've seen, certainly the fad brands, that's exactly the story. It's not just the product. It's the, it's the character or nature of the people behind them oftentimes. Uh, it's the difference between even the hoverboard and the my pillow or something like that where one is long term that should have been a fad like a bamboo pillows or something were uh and compared to something that was short term because it's about the character it's about the nature of the people who are building it and working it so uh understand that success and entrepreneurship especially is not a one to one ratio if you looked at my calendar for 30 days it's not like uh, you, 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 you might have a hard time tying that to revenue. I have a hard time tying it to revenue <laughs> most of the time. So you say, okay, well, you got this meeting, this meeting, how does it go back to revenue? Which you have to ask that question, right? That's just part of, of, of business. I mean, you can't just sit around and do, do things, uh, you know, whatever you want. You're not retired. I mean, you're working, but the key is work in areas that yield the results. What's the process of the work? So, uh, you may be meet in, in, in strategic meetings, but are they in? Are you in strategic meetings with the wrong people, uh, or headed the wrong direction? Is it not landing? Uh, are you not pivoting? But are you not learning from different uh, meetings that you're having? So these are the type questions that you really have to have to examine, and you have to understand uh, what process does it take to get you where you want to be. What process does it take to get you where you want to be? Uh, and then you go to work on creating the process, creating those daily disciplines and the daily behaviors and habits that will get you there. And that that is what will will really go a long way uh, to ensuring your success. So we want to make sure that you each of you have the tools for that. Now, uh, I'm going to ha take updates from your businesses here in just a moment. But um, uh, in fact, actually, let's go ahead and do that because I'm going to close uh, with, with three, three, three things that I think will be a great help to you. So, uh, let's talk about your businesses. Uh, somebody go ahead and, 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 and show your video and unmute and, uh, and, and, and share, uh, kind of where your business is now and maybe even specifically, uh, as you know, this year or with COVID and things like that. All right, uh, Kelly, why don't you start? Why don't you, uh, or Prisca, uh, either one of you, why don't you, you, you brave entrepreneurs, uh, launch oh, us out here. Okay, okay, Kelly, okay, Kelly will start. Let me unmute Kelly here. Prisca, why don't you go ahead and start maybe while while Kelly? Oh no, he we got him. All right, go ahead, sir. Okay. All right, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Roland. Greetings, yes, my pleasure. All right, I hope you can hear me perfectly. Yes, sir, very well. 
Okay. Um, my name is Kelly Nguira. I'm into drilling business. That's boho drilling, water projects. You know, the, the business that we do is really good and it is very profitable, especially here in Africa. Very, very profitable. If you're lucky, you can make a, you can make a fortune is just a single project. Now, if I talk about what we are doing right now, I would say right now we don't really, we are not really doing anything because it's, we are off season. It's a rainy season now. So during rainy season, it is not good to do the drilling because the water tables are high. So there are a couple of challenges that we, do, we, we encounter when it's rainy season. One, the machinery that sometimes we use couldn't reach to other remote areas because the road is slippery, too much mud. So normally during rainy season, if I say I'm working right now, I'll be lying to you. So right now it's a frozen season. So we we'll start working probably in March, April, when the rain stops. That's when we can allow our machines to go on in the ground. And again, the other disadvantage of working this time is you might get enough water, but then that might not be lasting water. So when you drill during um, dry season, the water that you get, you are sure it could be permanent water. Mm. So now you could be cheated by the surface water. You might drill a bowl, after three months, you'll be told the water is no longer there. And you'll be wondering, how did that happen? It's because you drill during rainy season when the water levels are high. Interesting. So for now, mm -hmm. so for now we, basically, we are not really doing anything, but we are just looking at the market. We just say, OK, if we open the season, who's willing, who's ready to give us, to, to give us an offer to work for them? That's what we are basically doing right now, but not working on the ground. So you're taking orders, pre-orders? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And how long does the season last? If it starts March or April, how long does it go through? When does raising season start? Um, normally, it was, okay. Like here in Africa, sometimes the, the, the climate is crazy sometimes. But we compromise. We can start from, April, from March, April, May, June. July, we have a little rain, but it's not really complicated. It's not, that would stop us to work. July, August, September, October. When it's getting to November, we have to, it's, it's now starting raining. So we also have to pause. We could pause for four months again. Right, November, but within February. Yes, so within these working, working months, trust me, if you have a good order, you can make good money. Now, so what our biggest does a good order look like? Sorry? What is a good order in that business, in your business? What, do, okay. what does a good order look like? Is that a bunch okay, of for example, from a customer? Okay. For, for example, I'll give you um, an example. I requested the money for the rig. It was about 130,000 US dollars. So um, I got a contract, but now I failed to do it because I don't have a rig. But in that contract, I was given almost 60 bohos. So the requirement was, show us your machines that you're able to do the work within this specific time. Because one boho, we, we can drill a bow within a day, and then tomorrow we do the, the, the padlock, the cement thing. So maximum, we just say three days. We can be on the ground three days doing one boho. And one boho in Africa could cost probably 4,000, 4,500 or $5,000. It depends with the area. And the price differs with the distance sometimes. If you're going very far, you might charge more because of the distance. And again, if you're going in an air, start drilling in a rocky area and in on a sand, it's different. So we also, the price is different. Mm. Mm. So what I mean by a good, a good business is the project that I, the offer that I got, outweighs the, 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 the amount of rig. I can make more money and, and say, okay, Dr. Roland, we've made more money within this period and it's more than what I requested for. That's what I mean by a good deal. And a good deal sometimes might look like, might look like, hey, get uh, 20 bows here, get 10 bows here, but then they come frequently. That's also a good deal. I don't have to get 50 bows at once. 
But if frequently, if I frequently get the business, I don't have time to rest, then that's a good deal as well. So how much is a used borehole, uh, a used rig, excuse me? Oh, a used rig, it, it, okay. A used rig, like the way I researched it, it's, if it's 120, 130, thousand you can get a good rig but if you want a new one a brand new one then it's two hundred and fifty thousand two hundred thousand that's it okay so you were pricing the good used one okay great um mm. so uh, does it work the same way there uh do they have equipment rentals in africa like for example yes absolutely. yeah yeah okay go ahead yeah, actually that is what is killing our business because we we have a company that normally we, we hire them because we don't have the equipments. We were using manual drilling. Now, manual drilling has got a big problem. You could go to other areas where you can drill because it's rocky. Now, our equipments are not strong enough to penetrate the rock. So what we do is we subcontract some Indian guy. He's a good guy. But the problem is if you subcontract with him, he will give you conditions. So what we mean is sometimes you might say, okay, I have a contract with a ABC company and ABC company wants to start drilling in two months. But now this owner of the rig has got a project. It can't work in two months, but these guys, they're in a hurry. They want in two months. So you can promise them, but the truth is you can't deliver in two months because the rig is not yours. And the owner is using it for four months. So that's a big problem. Well, but you're going to have that problem no matter what, because that's what I was thinking. And, and one of the problems that need to be solved is even if that was your rig and you are, and you had the job that the other owner has, whenever that new job comes in and says he wants it in two months, you know, you've already committed your own rig to a different project. So it's almost like I need another rig. You, you're either going to need more rigs or you need a, uh, people just have to get in line you know you'll get your borehole when you get your borehole and we go by order you know uh, no but then it's it's different from when the rig is yours because you've you can plan right but then if the rig is for someone you, you've got no say you have to flow with them completely agree that's the big that's the biggest challenge that we are having the second challenge is um when we get the rig from that person he would tell you, I'm going to do the whole contract. I'm going to give you commission. Now, the commission, they might say, okay, we are going to give you 7% of the money or 10% if you are lucky. You know, but then by the look of the things, if you give someone 40 boholes and is giving you 10% of the amount, it is as good as you don't do it at all. Even if they say a slow movement of a tiger is not a mistake, but a calculated accuracy. But come on, you are enriching someone. If there's a chance to get your own rig and make that money that he's getting from you, go for it. Okay, that's what I think. That one for a second. So, if you, if if you, if the client was coming through you, then mm -hmm. they're your company. So mm -hmm. really, you're not contracting with the with the person with the rig for the full amount. You just go to mm -hmm. that person, and, let, and if you're the one making five thousand dollars on that job. You go to mm -hmm. the person and say, I've got a job over here. It's $4,000 a borehole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. $4, so then you just took your 20%, 25% off the top as opposed mm -hmm. to the, uh, the customer paying the end uh, person for doing the fulfillment directly. And then you just getting some pennies back. So that's right. Yeah. That definitely invert that process. Um, and because the subcontractor needs to get paid from you and you collect from the customer and then you don't have to worry about getting 7% or 10%. You've got a nice 20% uh, profit off the top. Uh, mm. You know, so that's a, that's a good way of doing it as well. But now the problem is the owner of the rig will tell you what, how he wants his things to be done. We are desperate. We want his rig. He will tell you, I want to get the money in my account. I'm the one to pay you. Well, you want the rig. He's got the rig. We, okay, fine. Let the money come into your account and then you have to pay me back my money. That's, that's how it goes here in Africa. So let me ask so you, I can, how, how, many, mm -hmm. how many rigs are in your area? You're, 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 what country are you in? Malawi. 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 So mm -hmm. how many rigs are in your area? 
Well, uh, I can't tell really because there are a couple of companies. But then, like you said, you have to look earlier on when you're starting, you say you have to look at the values. You look at the people that you can click with, that you think alike. You know, so the, the kind of companies that I work with that are so recommended and so experienced, they're probably two, if not three. But there is one company that I usually work with and that person, I trust him. At least that person can deliver. If he tells you next week, he might miss with the week. He's very ethical. But then we still have a problem. We can tell him what to do because he's the owner of the rig. If he's got something planned, then that's it. Yeah. Got it. That's where our challenge is. That's why we said, no, we have to apply for a rig. We couldn't handle that anymore because we've lost some good business because of that. I'm sure. I am sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the reason why I asked that is, okay, let me ask one other question. Uh, are there other people like you that would be in the business but don't have the equipment? Yes, yes. There are a couple of them. That much, there are a couple of them. I know them. So one thought here um, is, and going back to what I started off in the beginning, I, we'd have to really think through what's first, what's second, what's third, what's, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you could be in a unique business to not only, you know, drill some holes, but also rent the equipment. It may be a better business model to rent rigs out uh, as opposed to even doing the holes yourself. So let me explain mm -hmm. uh, by that. And then it's not a matter of two, three, four providers, rig providers. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody becomes a rig provider or, or rig, uh, dig their own holes. You almost put the other people out of business. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So like in the United States, equipment rental is a, is a huge, huge business, a high margin business as well. And a lot of people will rent bulldozers and uh, ditch diggers and you know uh, different types of heavy duty construction equipment uh, mm -hmm. in order to to to, um, to to go fulfill a job so a lot of con uh, construction people are out there advertising their business and then whenever they get a job they go rent the bulldozer to go do the job you know wow uh, so every mm -hmm. company every person uh, that's why there's so many entrepreneurs in the construction space it's none mm -hmm. of them have enough money to go buy their own equipment you know mm -hmm. sometimes for the first few years um now they may eventually keep saving their their resources and buy a used you know piece of equipment and and kind of get going that way to increase their margin but it's more mm -hmm. important to be profitable and to get started than it is to focus on margin exclusively in that's this business right. at the beginning so i and that's what you've done so you're already doing it which is fantastic but mm. um and here's here's the thought if you made that your business model then mm -hmm. a lender is more likely to give you enough money for three or four rigs not one rig mm -hmm. you're wanting rigs to go drill holes uh now we're concerned about do you have the right team do you have uh people that you can trust to manage and operate and what about the risk associated with them what if somebody gets hurt on the job and uh, the transport to and from and the equipment breaking and all this as opposed to if you rent that out then the person using it is responsible you're protected no matter what uh, in terms of uh, uh you can charge them insurance when they rent it uh as well uh, that covers your insurance on the equipment uh, so mm -hmm. that if something is damaged or broken, you're able to get it repaired. But um, you may make, uh, you know, five times the amount and, and not have to uh, deal with the muddy roads and uh, really customers. Uh, consumers are not, uh, they can be quite demanding, right? <laughs> uh, That's right. How, how That's that borehole was put in and uh, what it looks like. And like you said, the delivery. But none of that mm -hmm. becomes your issue. Your customers become the contractors themselves who mm -hmm. then rent the mm -hmm. machinery from you. Uh, also, I will tell you that it becomes a, a cleaner business model because you can uh, less hours for you and more hours with your family because you can mm -hmm. be open, you know, you know, six days a week, you know, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. or, you know, whatever it is. And if it's after mm -hmm. hours, then it goes to the next day, you know, for an extra day rental charge or however you end up structuring things. But, uh, but that's not the case in a consumer business where many times they may only be there on the weekends or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the evenings, you got to do it when you can or when they're there. Um, mm -hmm. 
So that also change that changes the request a little bit if you if you mm. add that part. So uh, I would consider that, and we have a lender uh, that I'm hoping to get an update from over the next couple of days, or first mm -hmm. of next week. That uh, that that is is a, a lender of these type things, and so it's been very very difficult uh, the last six mm -hmm. months, uh, and and then of course. Uh, with COVID continuing, which a lot of people did, thought that it would end in August, uh, but then mm -hmm. where obviously the fall came and it, another round of lockdowns and, and uh, you know, I know Malawi even locked down the week of Christmas again, you know, and yep. um, South Africa, it just got locked out. The United States, nobody can travel there. I mean, which is the, I mean, it is, it is kind of a fresh round of things. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting from a business perspective. Uh, but I do think that, uh, but, but they're reopening now the branch and the people that we were uh, talking to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're hoping to, to find out more uh, about them and what they'll require. Uh, but I mm -hmm. think they would be a good fit for, for you in, in terms of financing, um, wow. bigger rigs, but, uh, but you just need to put some thought to that. Uh, what business are you really in? Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, I remember really studying for a long time. I would always ask myself these questions. Uh, hey, what business am I in? What am I really in? You know, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. like, uh, I may think I'm in, in uh, into fl the flooring business, you know, tile, carpet, mm -hmm. and all that. I may think I'm in the flooring business, but I'm probably in the people business. I'm probably dealing with yeah. people and customers and associates and, you know, mm -hmm. I, that's probably most of my life. The flooring is almost an afterthought. That's just a, the, the, the end, uh, the means to the end, not the end. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think ac accurately describing what business you're in, knowing business you're in, knowing business you want to be in, um, mm -hmm. each one of those means a different lifestyle for you. And what you that's right. to find out two years into it that this is killing me. This is hurting my marriage. Mm -hmm. It's hurting my kids. Uh, That's right. Something different. So you got to ask yourself kind of what business am I in? And then, oh, is that really the business I want to be in? And then if mm -hmm. not, it may be the same. It may still be in with rigs, but it, like we said, it may be on the rental side of that. And uh, the fact that there's already a market for people who don't want to own, who can't afford to own the rig, but they can go out and get mm -hmm. customers and jobs and then rent the rig from you. If it, I would rather have a piece of equipment working for me than me having to do the work today. You That's right. That's right. So, uh, you know, there's a couple businesses I've always envied, uh, not in a obsessive, you know, bad way, but in terms of the model, I really like the model. And that is like in mm -hmm. the construction zones, how they have cones, uh, and mm -hmm. they have barricades, and they have like porta potties at all events. They're required to have the outdoor restroom, you know, porta potty and, uh, mm -hmm construction sites or dumpsters. Uh, mm -hmm. All of these are examples of industries where inanimate objects are your employees. But guess what? Mm -hmm. Those employees don't talk back. Those employees don't cop attitudes. <laughs> Those mm -hmm. employees uh, you don't have to pay health insurance for. Those employees yes. don't ask for a raise. <laughs> Those employees mm -hmm. work 24-7. Those employees don't have to go to sleep at night. It's a they're, they're mm -hmm. the best employees in the world, right? Mm -hmm. so, That's right. So, mm -hmm. Getting, thinking about businesses like that uh, really, uh, you know, can, can transform what you're able to do. That's also the, I mean, the internet. That's why e-commerce is, you know, I mean, obviously yeah. 20 years strong, but that's why it's been uh, so, so, so uh, incredible. And, you know, in the beginning, people didn't trust. It was a trust issue. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, trust is a commodity and, and, and the internet didn't really have it. And since I couldn't see somebody, they, people were afraid they'd take their money and run. But then it is so developed now that, you know, you can't hide if you do some, if somebody did something like that, there's, there's much recourse and, uh, certainly the negative publicity and, and ads and so forth. Uh, so, so yeah, I think those are some, some ways to, to think about this. Uh, and hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Um, very helpful, very helpful, Dr. Alan. Yeah, I, I really like it. I'm glad we were able to explore uh, dive mm -hmm. into your business because especially understanding the seasonality. Uh, mm -hmm. it, let me leave you with this one uh, bit of wisdom as well that uh, I was taught. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, do you remember hearing about the gold rush 
in, in California, maybe I, I, you, you all have so much gold in Africa, maybe not. But in America, we had a what they call the California gold rush uh, in mm-hmm. I think like 1800s or something, late 1800s. And uh, uh, everybody that wanted to make a buck, right, the, all the entrepreneurs, uh, they would sell their farm, sell what they had in the east, and they'd travel out west and, uh, and, and, and to seek, you know, to strike it rich. Mm-hmm. And, um, obviously, most people lost everything because they sold everything, went and spent all the all the money, and never, you know, struck gold, wow. and, you know, that kind of thing. But they, but but here's the principle in business that they mm-hmm. say from that: the only people who make money in a gold rush are the people selling the picks and the shovels, hmm. the equipment to okay. mine for gold. What you're selling is the hope and the potential to go make money. You're selling the instruments. So a whole lot of other people that may never strike gold, you're selling the picks and the shovels to go dig for gold. Most of them never will. Mm. See, so it's better to sell sell the, a means to an end for people, especially when mm. the end is, is there's two things that you're feeding. There's only two reasons mm. why people buy anything. Um you know, it, uh, it, it can be the fear of missing out, uh, what we call FOMO, meaning if I don't mm-hmm. buy it right now, it's gone and there's only one like it in the world. And so, if you know, they, they buy it that way. So, or it's too, but let me simplify it. The two reasons people buy anything is to avoid pain or gain pleasure. Mm-hmm. All right. They, people, the only reason people buy is to avoid pain or gain pleasure. Mm-hmm. So when you start looking at what business you're in and what will sell and how to increase revenues, you mm-hmm. need to really be asking the right questions. See, the wrong questions get you the wrong answers. The right questions, you'll get the right answers. Many people That's right. are doing what they're doing. They got answers, but they asked the wrong mm-hmm. question, right? It's kind of like mm-hmm. they climbed the ladder, hip, uh, you know, hip, hip, hooray for you. You climbed the ladder only to find out it was leaning against the wrong tree, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so ask the right questions uh, and you'll get the right answers. And um, yeah, I think knowing what business you're in, mm. the, the two questions I would also ask, what problem do I solve? Mm-hmm. What problem do I solve and who owns that problem? Mm-hmm. What problem do I solve and who owns that problem? Uh, and what I mean by that is, if I have, if I have cybersecurity technology, mm. that's the product. But what problem am I solving, and for who? So, what problem uh, am I solving, and then who owns that problem? Because that's who is going to write the check. That's who's going to pay mm. for it. The mm-hmm. problem is, and if there are several people, and you, if your answer is, well, this is who has the problem but they're not willing to write the check, then it's either A, not the real problem, or you're trying to solve mm-hmm. a problem that doesn't exist. If it's a real problem and it exists, then it's a matter of keep keep asking questions to discover who owns that problem. Whose problem mm. is it? Because if, if, you've, if it's a real problem, but no one is buying your solution, mm. then then you, you're talking to the wrong owner of the problem. They're not buying mm-hmm. because there's not enough ownership that that's my problem to solve. Like I'm not responsible for fixing that. It's a problem. I see it's a problem, but it's not my job to fix it. It's kind of like if you go to uh, try to get the sales department of a company to buy human resource technology. They would just be like, yeah, our company may need it, but I'm the wrong person to be talking to about it. You need to talk to mm-hmm. human services or human resource. Uh, human capital division, you know, uh, they're the ones who care about that. They're mm-hmm. the ones who have budget for it, not us. So uh, who, what problem do you solve? What business are you in? What problem do you solve? Mm-hmm. And who owns that problem? Uh, those are the three questions that uh, uh, even mm-hmm. established companies, you know, when they went into McDonald's and did that, asked those mm-hmm. questions, that was when McDonald's first discovered that they were not in the hamburger business. They were in the real estate business. Oh, wow. Hmm. McDonald's is not in the hamburger business. 
they're in the real estate. That's business. new. They own uh, their real estate portfolio is much greater than what their you know their sales of hamburgers and so forth. Uh, hmm. It is the, their empire. It was how they bought up the most valuable land at intersections around the world, and then uh, rented out that space to their franchisees. So hmm. they're not even the ones making hamburgers. They they sell a franchise for a million and a half dollars to a franchisee who then has to rent the land that they bought from them. Hmm. Right? They're in the real estate business. They're they're just landlords. <laughs> and wow. They come out with menus and so forth. I'm telling you now. If McDonald's thought they were in the hamburger business, I'm sorry, friends, but I can make a better. I, you, we we both could grill a better hamburger in the backyard. Right. That's right. Uh, That's right. So, so if they were in the hamburger business, they're doing a horrible job of making hamburgers, but they're they're not in the hamburger business. That's just a means to an end. Uh, it's a byproduct. That's why mm. you're focused. Most entrepreneurs are focused on the wrong outcome. You're focused on mm. the burger. You're supposed to be focused on the business, which has nothing to do with the hamburger. It has little to do. Wow. With it. So. Um, wow. This is what I'm trying to shift in African enterprises because we don't have examples of African brands that we can point to and say, this should be a global brand. This African That's company, right. this African uh, restaurant chain, this African uh, distribution company, this, this mm -hmm. you know, sh should be global. Uh, we don't have any of that. We don't have innovative products uh, that an inventor made uh, there made in Africa. We've got great products uh, that are sold, but uh, we don't have brands and companies that are global because of, because mm. they, that we're, because they miss these points. Uh, That's right. That is what I'm challenging us to. Uh, I mean, can you imagine if you not only owned uh, the rigs there, but if you started renting additional equipment that contractors needed uh, for the mm -hmm. construction of their uh, uh, of there in Malawi, and then what if it spread to different parts of Malawi, or what if it spread to other African countries where you had other organizations where you rented the same equipment because they're needing boreholes all over Africa, right? There's a lot of organizations and companies and people and individuals and contractors that uh, you could build a brand around equipment rental for the construction industry, for the water industry, um, you know. So uh, just some things to think about. So. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. That was a bit. Thank you very much, Dr. Rowland. That's good. That's we have so much. We have we have so much to talk about, but I will give a chance to my friends too to to to, to explain their business. I would love to learn from them too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. And uh, I, I uh, will be uh, in touch as we hear on the lenders, um, mm -hmm. and uh, also, uh, you know, Water for the World, uh, the partners there in in Africa as you have the equipment to do it. I, I, like you said, getting business is not the hard part for the business you're in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you may have to drill some boreholes before you and make enough money to buy a second rig yourself or, a you know what I mean? Yeah, or, or, or maybe <laughs> we get enough funding for two rigs um, and you're gonna use one and rent one out whenever you're not using it, but you eventually wanna get to where you're renting out all of the equipment that you have. Uh, that's a much, more sustainable business model. And it makes, let me say this and, and we'll close, but this is good for everyone. It mm -hmm. makes your, on a business valuation, mm -hmm. when, when, when any outside company or an accounting firm comes in to say, how much is your business worth? Mm -hmm. Not all revenue is created equally. Okay. That's right. If your business is doing a million dollars and Miss Prisca's business is doing a million dollars. It is not equal. Mm -hmm. If one That's person's if you're having to go out and and do the work yourself as in a service element every day for your million dollars, and Ms. Prisca has a recurring revenue where maybe it's a membership website and people pay ten dollars a month and she has a thousand customers, uh, yeah. you know, then her revenue is recurring, and and so there the whereas your multiple may only be two times revenue, what we call two x revenue. Uh, mm -hmm. hers can uh, will literally be eight to ten times revenue from evaluation that's right so mm -hmm. so that's important to understand when you're really looking through these business models is not just how mm -hmm. much money you make in the margin but what's the value of your company because at that's some point you're going to sell it you want to sell it at some point uh, mm -hmm. because 
because as an entrepreneur, you'll have a different dream. You'll have a different vision. You'll grow from where you are. Now. So you'll want mm -hmm. to take this money and do something else, but you want to get top dollar. So really be mindful. That's it makes it more attractive to whoever's buying it. Uh, because if the business is built on you or what you know in your mind or your particular skill, then I can't really buy your business because I need you. And what happens if you get sick? What happens if you can't work anymore? What happens if this happens or that happens? Um, but if it's a recurring revenue model, then I can plug and play and I can buy that business quickly and easily with less risk and for 10 times the, <laughs> the amount. Uh, so anyway, thank you for pulling some of those things out of me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. And I've learned so much from you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With blessings. Yes, yes, with great pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Miss Prisco? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Roland. Wow, what a what a, uh, an inspiring discussion there on Kelly's business. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah. Tell yeah, us now coming what's your business. Tell us uh, where, yeah. where things are. Yeah, well, things have, have, have been challenging in the past few months. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the COVID-19 the, uh, COVID has really uh, affected us badly. Uh, our product is a food product. Um, I think if you can remember from last discussion, it's a social enterprise. And the problem that we are trying to solve is really uh, build incomes, increase incomes for poor women uh, who are, are growing uh, these, um, uh, these crops, you know, that we buy from them, the millet, the cassava that we process, you know, into meals and package and sell into, you know, uh, uh, stores. Uh, our, our main aim is to try and get this product as much as possible into the chain stores that have got so many stores uh, so that our, uh, our, 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 uh, our sales increase. And I mean, when we have more sales, then, you know, we are buying more from the women and they have more, more money. Yeah. So uh, in the past few months, actually, we, we, we have noticed that our sales have really gone down uh, in, in, in the shops because I think the economy has just generally not been doing so well. So the buying power of people, you know, has affected even our product because I can't, um, I wouldn't uh, say that I could uh, place uh, cassava uh, at the same level as maize meal, for instance, that we, you know, we eat uh, uh, all the time. And, uh, but we've been trying to push, you know, uh, from the last time we talked, we, we had ShopRite, you know, on the table. We still have ShopRite. In fact, they have even increased. At, we, we are now at 16 in the number of shops. And that's where I'm saying, you know, the economy has really affected COVID uh, and maybe movements of people and so on, the, uh, the, the, the sales, because we have got more shops, but we have less, you know, sales have gone down. And then we, uh, so, but we're still pushing, looking at other avenues. Um, we have got to, uh, uh, two, more, two more supermarkets in Lusaka that uh, we, 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 we just, you know, entered into agreement this, this month. And uh, well, the other one, Melissa store was December, but this other one is uh, 24 more. It's, uh, it's this, this, this month. And they have actually given us a shelf, like they've said, this is your shelf, this is where you put, you know, your products and so on. So that uh, seems to be, uh, it seemed to be really good, you know, for us that we can be able to have that shelf and put, you know, our products and we are waiting to see how that market is going to grow. Then we are still in discussion uh, with uh, Zambie for, uh, this is a, a, a company that started with selling beef, you know, and several outlets all over the place, like more than a hundred outlets. Uh, but now they are selling other stuff as well. They are selling mealy meal, they are selling, you know, other things. And so we, they were not selling our products. And so we went to them with that idea and say, well, why don't you include 
cassava and millet on your, you know, and so it's been an issue of discussion with management and things are looking good. I just, uh, you know, pray and hope that uh, they will not take this good business idea to somebody else. So we are still in discussion uh, with, with management. We also looked at another avenue of uh, 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 trying to sell in bulk. You know, in Africa, we have got these markets, you know, marketplaces where these women, you know, sell, you know, in market stores and things like that. We realized that part of the market, uh, I mean, traditionally anyway, the, I mean, the way our people have bought cassava and millet is at the market. You know, as I mentioned, these things, these crops, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, things are just uh, really going now into upmarket shops where now people are buying convenience, you know, well packaged and looking good and so on. But they would be in the market and, uh, you know, someone has got a big bag of, uh, you know, the cassava and they are decanting, you know, in small uh, bits and so on. Now, it's interesting when I, you know, when we tried to go with our package in the markets and then, you know, uh, the salespeople I, I, I sent said, well, the, 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 the people don't want to buy an already packaged, you know, uh, a product because they don't get the, um, uh, now we call it in Basela, I don't know what to, the, the extra, you know, when, when you measure something like a ball, maybe they do a ball of something and then they put this little bit you know extra it says because the packet doesn't have that 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 extra interesting so i thought well why don't we try to approach these marketeers and tell them hey we are going to um we can supply you with these you know uh with uh, with cassava meal or with millet meal we will grind it for you and pack it nicely in a bag with a plastic inside so that it doesn't get wet and things like that. And we, and we want to be your suppliers for this, for this product. So we, we had to work out, you know, pricing and things like that. And um, it seems it's something that, you know, a, a few of the marketeers in very busy market, a, a very busy market that we, we wanted to start with here in Kitwe are interested in doing. Uh, but January, again, has not been a very good month, even for the marketeers. So they're saying, well, hang on. We like your price. We think, you know, we think we are good. We could do business. And we did the same thing with marketeers at the border town of Congo, uh, Congo and Zambia, Kasumbalesa. Uh, you know, so we went there and, you know, engaged some of these marketeers. And they said, well, we like the idea and uh, the, the, um, this is just this is a discussion we had only you know like last week, and this is something that we can be able to you know to run with with them. So um, I'm hoping you know that as the year you know uh, picks up, our sales you know could also pick up you know in this in in this area and all these new markets that we are trying to explore will also you know pick up. Um, in terms of, you know, the challenges that we have and that, that we really we are trying to address is the factory space, as I mentioned last time. I mean, we are in rented property. It's a, it's a small space. Uh, we, 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 we need to, uh, to have inventory to store, you know, our products because these things are grown seasonally, you know, like the millet. So you have to bulk buy and store them and uh, uh, and then, you know, keep using them over um, uh, uh, during the year. And then the other aspect is the, is the equipment. Now, this is where we, we, we wanted to buy the, um, the, 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 the auger filler uh, so that we could include other products, you know, other, uh, other millet products, other cassava products, uh, such as, you know, instant porridges and uh, uh, cereals, uh, you know, that you could put maybe a granola mix or something like that, so that we increase our product range. Um, 
and have more take up of, of, of our millet and our, our, our cassava. Yeah, so I well, think that's it. Yeah, no, that, what an update. Thank you for sharing. Um, a, a few questions, and I, I, I may have asked this prior. Uh, what is this storage life, uh, the shelf life of, of the product if you had more storage? Uh, about a year. Okay. Uh, so, and you're on, what, what part of Zambia are you in? In, in, in Kitwe, on, on the western uh, side of Zambia, in Kitwe. Okay, how yeah. far is that from Lusaka? It's about seven hours, six, okay. seven hours drive from Lusaka. West of that, okay. And you're west of Lusaka, okay. And then how far are you from the Congo border, the RC that you mentioned? Uh, uh, two, two and a half hours, three hours from the Congo border. Okay, so you're closer to that than you are? Yeah, we are closer actually to the Congo border than to Lusaka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so let's back up a bit. Um, congratulations on increasing the number of distributors. Uh, with the stores, increasing the number of stores, uh, big Thank box you. stores. That's that's great work. Uh, it's moving the right direction, uh, and of course, adding the two other retailers in uh, Osaka. Uh, th those are great wins. But to your point, it's going down. You know, and that is a that, that probably is a COVID impact without a doubt, uh, because yeah. shopping plazas. I, I I don't think they're open the same amount of time. Right, they're shortened hours. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right now and. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Zambia has had curfews or not, but uh, uh, but that that could be something. I think ultimately, though, um, it goes back to to a, something that a, a principle and a lesson that I've really learned in business, which is it is very difficult to rely on big box stores for your revenue. Hmm. We have to look at big box stores as as a as a, as a ch marketing channel, as a credibility booster. So what I really encourage entrepreneurs is, and especially because I go back to the very first statement you made, which is the women marketers or entrepreneurs in your network, you know, uh, that uh, need more income, but the yeah. sales aren't there. Uh, ultimately, that's what, I, that's what we, one of the problems as a social enterprise, we really wanna solve. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if we could sell pink ponies and do it, we'd do that instead of making, you know, millet and selling it. And uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. Right? right. We would do it. So because the goal is to yeah. provide a better life for these women. Yeah. Uh, so uh, because having your your product, it, the more stores, big box stores that your product is in, the more shelf space you have. Uh, the more credibility your product has in the market, mm. okay, outside of those stores, even if a very small percentage of your revenue comes from that. Some people even view their big box uh, products as lost leaders, uh, meaning we don't even make anything or pennies on that. It's these yeah. other, it's how we leverage being in there. How, it's how we leverage that credibility that creates the revenue. So um, I, my mind is trying to solve the problem of how we increase revenue, uh, increase the income of the of, of, of the women uh, entrepreneurs, and um, I go back to one thing that we discussed. I think previous. I want to see where if that conversation has gone anywhere, but um, and that is if if people can buy the stuff in stores or uh, they can buy it from you. Set up little businesses that these women have out of their homes or, as you said, out of the local market. Uh, mm -hmm you know, and things like that, uh, where, where they're responsible for the marketing, right, uh, of, of the product. Um, so I want to, to talk about that. Uh, have, have we been able to empower some of those to where they're able to buy the big bags um, of, of ground uh, source and ground material, uh, just like the shopping stores that you mentioned Want, mm. they want that little extra. Um, and I think that's a great idea. Um, mm. And and there's absolutely a market for that. Uh, and I'm just going to I'm just going to put a few things out there and then I just want you to kind of respond on all the, on, on the different things. Um, mm. 
I think about like peanuts and produce mm -hmm. uh, many times. Yes, there are some packaged peanuts, but there's always these sections at stores where you can go dip, you know, yeah. choose the amount that you want. And to your yeah. point, put, yeah. put the extra few in there you to feel better about it. But you charge by the pound instead of, yeah. you know, by the, and it's cheaper for everybody yeah. to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, produce, you know, I love jalapeno poppers. Uh, we take jalapenos, cut them in half, put some cream yeah. cheese in, in uh, beef, and uh, then sprinkle more cheese on top and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and put it in the oven and it's, it's delicious. But I like to choose how many jalapenos go in and, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. uh, if they sold them prepackaged, uh, you know, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but I, I it's, uh, we're used to as consumers doing that. And then also to that point, uh, in the in the sixties, nineteen sixties, I believe it was, they were just coming out with cake mix, box mm. cake mix, uh, yeah, and it's where you literally just mixed it with water and put it in the oven, yeah. and it made the cake. Yeah, well, they could not sell it. They nobody would uh, the women would not buy it. And they couldn't figure out why, and you know, different surveys and what have you. They what they ended up realizing is the reason that product is because they knew people wanted convenience, so they made it super convenient. But then yeah. there was something they didn't count on, which was uh, women felt guilty using it because it was too convenient. They felt like they hadn't put love into making this for their family. So mm -hmm. what the what the company did was they actually changed the recipe so that it required you to add usually one egg, one uh -huh. egg, add one egg. And once they changed it to where it was pre-made, but yet you had to do one thing, yeah, two seconds, all of a sudden that made it feel like you made the cake. Mm. There's that emotional need that, that consumers had uh, uh, back then and so to this day, if you buy a cake mix, you have to add an egg. Yeah. But it was because people weren't buying it if you if it was already done for you, pre-made. So yeah. I say that to your point of with these shopping stores and they want the little extra, listen to the consumer in that because it's the difference between it nothing selling and, and it going like crazy because it can mm. be an experience. It may be an experience for the for the boy or the girl child that's with the mama. When she's yeah. shopping, uh, where yeah. that becomes their job, they get to scoop it out, and it's fun for them. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's engaging for the family. So I think there are some some things like that that uh, you definitely want to. We would say it here like a gamify it, uh, mm. and, and really what I'm meaning is just create an experience around purchasing your product at a supermarket or at the big box mm. retailer create an experience mm -hmm. around buying mm -hmm. your product. And if you do that, it will help the sales tremendously, whether they need the product or not, uh, they end up buying product just and finding uses for it because you know, the boy or the girl wants to scoop it out. And in order for them yeah. to behave in this grocery store, they're not gonna do it until they get to go scoop out some of your product, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and maybe it's a fun con color container that they like to, paper bag or plastic, you know, that they uh, like to use, or uh, maybe there's a sticker that comes with every single one for the, for the children. Yeah. You just want to create that supermarket experience um, mm -hmm. that makes it more about the, uh, you know, the experience than just the product. The other uh, aspect to that is I, I'm going to jump back now to the income and also just to sales during this time. Um, and that is, if you had a hundred women around the country, or even in the Congo, different countries, that you were able to, able to ship, they could buy it from you wholesale by the pound, and you ship it to them, and uh, and then them resell it mm. with the model that you've given them, either to stores, supermarkets in their area, and chains, or uh, uh, 
or at the really prefer the business model would be at the local uh, like supermarkets, uh, farmers markets, uh, you know, the ones with the pop up stores where it's a like a parking lot or the corner, uh, uh, yeah, a corner yeah. street corner or something and they set up their, you know, their wares. That's the kind of if, if they did that or even uh, made it to where people word of mouth, they could come to their, their house and get it you know on the front porch or something. If there was just a way that you could mobilize you know, hmm. 50 to 100 women uh, that way, if they had the product, then the customers might be more comfortable going to them than a store, especially in COVID. Um, and you do not want to rely on your revenues on the big box stores, because at some point, the big box stores always close. They always close. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so you don't want to build the whole business model on that. If you build it on the mobile entrepreneur concept and still hmm. have big box, then the, by having your product in the big stores, it just gives your uh, your entrepreneurs, your market marketeer women, uh, it gives them great credibility in the marketplace, uh, and and even a unique experience. And I would also say this: um, I think they they then get to control their they can control their own sales and destiny based on how hard they work, based on how much they promote and market where they will be, that they're consistent at being there at this time, this day, this time, this location, you know, and those kind of things, it gives them more control over their income. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and maybe, maybe they're not making enough being out there two days a week, maybe they need to go four days a week or five days a week. And, you know, so, uh, or stay longer or get an, there an extra hour earlier, or, you know, whatever they need to do, but at least it gives them some control over their income. Mm -hmm. And they're not just at the mercy of whatever happens uh, with mm -hmm. consumers at the stores. And uh, mm -hmm. that also protects the business and the income long-term so that there's always a place to get it. You've already uh, established alternative distribution mm -hmm. channels. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that like they say, um, dig your well before you're thirsty. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, build out these channels before you need them. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, mm. I, I really, I really like that because you could quickly grow into other, other markets. And I mean, uh, other mm. geographies and, and, and so forth. So it's yeah. the consumer experience. It's empowering the female uh, marketeer uh, in the market that they are in, in the different locales and serving them and giving them a business model that they can choose how much money they make based on how hard they work, mm. how much they sell. Um, and here's here, the last thing I'll say on that is what I love about that uh, is when a product becomes popular from the ground up as mm. opposed to top down. Ground up meaning what we're talking about with the female entrepreneurs. Mm. Uh, top down being from like shop rights, you know, and it's in the mm. big box stores. Mm. So they kind of they kind of push products on people. Uh, yeah. so, but an organic ground up product where mm. people just want it and they'll buy it from people on the corner. Uh, what happens is as that is successful, big box stores everywhere want to carry it. So it's going it, yeah. to make your job it, it, mm -hmm. much easier. In fact, they yeah. start calling you, you don't have to convince yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Everybody wins in that model. Your business is yeah. stronger. By the way, your margins are higher and healthier because they're coming to you. You're not having yeah. to go to them and take their margins. See? Yeah. So uh, yeah, those are some thoughts. What, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for those thoughts. Actually, you know, Dr. Roland, there's a um, there's an Indian man who he's a big entrepreneur. I mean, big guy, you know, doing all sorts of things. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to him, and every time I meet that guy, I always learn something from him. So okay. I remember when he came to the factory, he said. Why are you selling to the big box stores? You know, like, like you're saying, I don't sell. He does bottled water. He does all sorts of things. He says, I don't sell to them. You know, when I started making my sacks, I went to the market, you know, to soak on the market. And, you know, he says, it was a disaster in the first place, but I went to them. And finally, as you are saying, you know, those guys are now coming to me. I mean, I went to them and now they are coming to me. And these guys, you know, they, 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 they take so long to pay you. They will take 60 days, you know, but when you sell to them, uh, you know, to the marketeer, 
you will get your, 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 you know, your money instantly. But you know, that time I was looking at uh, ShopRite and say, wow, I mean, 30 stores, if I can get my products, you know, in 30 stores, why, why, why can't I just, you know, focus on there? And then the last time I met him, he, he was asking me, how are things going? I said, oh, things are, you know, are not moving so fast as I want them and says, then he asked me, who eats cassava meal, you know? And then I say, well, it's people like, it's, it's my friends. That's why I said, well, my friends. And then he says, well, sell it to, go to the churches, you know, go to the churches and, and sell, you know, your, your cassava there. So um, now one thing I have learned from you, which I want to, which, which, which I think I will scale up in terms of these, you know, uh, uh, pushing this single market is have a target and say, you know, I need 100 people, you know, to sell to the churches, to do door to door sales, you know, to, uh, to, to sell to the women at the market and things like that. Because I have started doing that, actually. I mean, I've been talking to, uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, and say, hey, would you like to, to sell, your, uh, you know, cassava meal? Because if you, if you get a bag, and you sell, you you know, you sell you 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 sell these uh, uh, bags. You I'll sell it to you at this price, and it's up to you whatever markup you want to add there. You know, for me, in fact, I I've been offering them and saying, I will give you the you know, like for instance, I would say I'll give you this bell, you know, which contains maybe ten one kg packs. Go with it and sell it, and just bring me, you know. Uh, my money, and then once you bring the money, and then we'll give you the second bag, you know, and and so on. You know, that's the. So I've done model. this. Sorry. That was the newspaper model. Ah, yeah. so, <laughs> so I, I I've done this for 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 a, a few people that I know, but I think from what you have said, I need to scale up on that, and be you know uh, affirmative and have a target and say. I need to get to 50 people or 100 marketeers who are going to do this. Already, there is a, 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 a woman in Lusaka whom I just delivered yesterday three, you know, bells. She's got this little store and she was selling rice, you know, she was just selling rice. And then her mom said, hey, I mean, maybe, I mean, the rice is a cereal. Maybe if she adds on this, you know, th th these two other products. I said, okay, I'll give her a few uh, samples. So she was visiting her daughter in Lusaka and she and her daughter called and said, these samples have gone, you know, can I please have, you know, uh, and so we have started a line there, you know, with her. And so I think I need to, to really firm up there and see how many 50, 60, 70 people can be able to push you know, in uh, this market, you know, like this. Yeah. The other um, idea that came up from the guys that went to the border, they said, you, you know, Congo, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know there whether you can give me also some advice and some ideas. Congo, they, the, 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 their main cereal that they eat, the, the, I mean, starch that they eat or a carb, you know, that they eat is cassava meal. In Zambia, it's maize meal, but for them, it's they eat cassava meal, and apparently, they don't have it processed in the shops. You know, like nicely packaged. Uh, uh, you know, so what they do is people just pound the tuba. You know, so if you are having a cassava meal that day, you get the tubers, you pound it in the mortar, and then you have your meal. And so those guys said when they were at the border, there was no one, uh, you know, that was, they, they thought it was a good idea for us to set up a, um, like a store that we, an outlet, let me call it an outlet where we, you know, we are stocking our, our cassava meal and, and, and so that we target uh, the, 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 the Congolese, uh, the Congolese market. Now, since they don't package, you know, they don't package their cassava meal, 
they, they you know they, they they cook it you know fresh like that uh, uh, how um i don't know what your comment would be there to in terms of how we can be able to push our product in that market because it it, it, it it's like people when they are faced with a new product they are like uh you know uh, how, how how can they you know uh, take that on and then I also I wanted to comment on the question you asked about the women uh, um, do you know selling their their product. I just wanted to mention that there are two types of women that we are talking about. There's the rural women and the peri-urban women that who are actually growing these products, mm -hmm. and 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 that's why we are we are targeting these products because they are grown by these poor women and we want to raise you know the market because they are low input they are you know the, the uh, they are they, they, they are low input and now people are increasingly becoming interested in in the products uh, because of their health benefits uh, so we want to impart so there's that rural woman and then there's also that urban woman who is a trader who is a you know who, who is a trader who is an entrepreneur who um who can sell you know at the market yes and i i i hear you i get your advice i am going to you know make uh, more effort in trying to reach yeah that that that, that sector of the market that's great that's great mm -hmm. i think if you have those people mobilized it would go a long way um yeah let's go to the back to the congo border the Congolese border. Um, uh, so a couple thoughts, and I'm hoping the yeah. second one comes back to me. The first is, remember how we were talking about with the shop rights and the big box stores, having that experience for them? Uh, yeah you don't want to put in a whole lot of investment into this because you don't know how it's going to work yet. Uh, what's going to be the best model to sell it? How do they yeah. want to buy it? Um, yeah. And so I know you were, uh, you know, there was the question on the packaging, but uh, that is where if you could find what we would call a reseller or, you know, a, a marketeer woman uh, who would, Kind of set up that outlet, set up that uh, that little depot or exchange, uh, mm. and with and the point of it being um, uh, that you could then sell it uh, wholesale the same way you are to the others, where it's in bulk, it's not packaged, really, yeah. uh, and people can uh, measure out how much they want, yeah. or they can scoop it out for them and put it in 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 some in yeah. a bags, yeah. but. Um, uh, that may be a good way, especially so that you don't have to figure out the packaging. Um, mm. And and especially if they don't even like it packaged, then this, this really opens it up for them um, until you learn their behavior. But I wanna go back to one thing that you said, uh, and you hit on a very incredible touch point. When you're coming out with a new product, Mm. or introducing a new product yeah if it's uh new to that area or or not new uh there are different types of sales uh that have to be made uh, in some places you are having to do what what we have talked about as an educational sale meaning yeah they're not just at the grocery store and then add cassava on there in some markets because you're like you said it's just kind of an extra it's an add-on they use it sometimes and they maybe not sure mm -hmm. when to use it or how to use it it's kind of a newer delicacy in their area but then you go to a place like the congolese border and it's a staple i mean it's yeah. the, you know for the health food the health benefits it's what they have so um uh or even instead of maize you know maize millet so you do not have the educational sale components at the congolese border that you will have in these other locations that's one of the why you have to create more of an experience uh yeah. in these other places uh, you have to create that experience for them because you need to engage them long enough to educate them on the product yeah. and the health benefits. <laughs> so while they're scooping it out, they've got to be able to see, read a few of the health benefits uh, on the on the, the packaging or on the display uh, 
case that's holding it, uh, you, you know, the box that uh, maybe all of the, they can drop that plastic insert in to dip out of, but you've got marketing bullet points right there in messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an educational sale. You don't have to focus on the educational sale as much on the Congolese border, which is why I would uh, try to get uh, enterprising marketeer women to uh, uh, where maybe you do have the first one like you've done and then pay you on the on the back end for the first one. But you still need a path to where people prepay for you. And maybe it's just as it takes off a little bit, you just change mm -hmm. the business model. And you can you know when to do that because you've got 10 other people reaching out to you, asking you to sell in the same place on the Congolese border. They want to have their own little shop, right? And sell yeah. this. So then you know, okay, it's this amount for the, uh, you. I charge this amount for this for this many uh, CGs or KGs, and um, uh, you know, and then when you pay, we ship, and that's you know that's how it works. And anytime you yeah. just you reorder, you reorder. So you yeah. can move from the model you have getting started to a prepay model, uh, okay. and, and 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 but as quickly as possible in all the markets, you want to shift that you know to a, to a yeah. prepay model. Um, yeah. But I think it's going to be a lot easier on the on the border because you don't have that educational component yeah. of the sale. Yeah. 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 And the, here's the other th reason that I think you're going to experience great success by in being intentional about focusing on your female marketeers in these other markets, uh, because it does require an educational sale in many of those markets. And so if it's coming from a lady who believes in it, then while while she's talking to her friends and those in her community, she's telling them about the benefits and how how people mm -hmm. love this and how people are using this every uh, elsewhere and the health benefits that go with it. She's educating because people buy from people they like and trust. Those are the two things. People buy yeah. from people they like and trust. So, a, the, in a store like a, the the big box stores, they may like and trust the store but they don't know about your particular brand because you're one of yeah. the products on the shelf so having a face specifically tied to your product in these regions where uh where it's not an, an everyday staple in their diet uh it's you're going to increase the sales in both the stores and uh for the individuals which obviously all benefits the rural woman uh mm -hmm. farmer yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. Good, good. Well, I think that gives us a few things to work on for the next few weeks. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Roland. Thank you for the. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Ms. Briska. Thank you for the work that you're doing uh, for mm -hmm. so many uh, women uh, uh, in Africa, in different countries, and just uh, you're, you're an inspiration. You're a real inspiration. All Thank right. You. Yes, with pleasure. Any other businesses uh, that want to, we have time for probably one more, and then I have some closing remarks. One more business, this is your chance. Just unmute and uh, undo your video and update on what's going on. Okay, what I will do, then is uh, if we have have no one moving towards that, let me go immediately to some closing remarks. We we opened up talking about focus and uh, understanding that sometimes to get to where we want, there's not a logical path that the, 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 the logical path is to not do the logical path because the logical path rarely gets you where you want to be. That the, the, the only thing logical in this life is to follow him and as he leads you, um, which could seem like he's leading you in the complete opposite direction of where you want to be. Uh, but you can know and rest that that's the only way to actually get there. Uh, in fact, sometimes whenever it doesn't make sense to me, I'm actually at the most peace because I know that it's something only he can do. 
and uh, because I can't get it there. And if I get it there logically, then it can be undone logically. But if he does it uh, supernaturally, just by through obedience and following and doing, you know, using the wisdom that he's given us, but not leaning on our own understanding, uh, then, then that's how we can ensure that we take the right steps and paths. You've heard the story about people selling their business for $600 million a week before the market tanked. The whole industry was just gone. And if he had waited one week to sell his business, he would have lost out on $600 million. Uh, I hear the same thing with different thing, investors. I hear that uh, some made a move, they held on too long, and then they lost it all. Or they sold at just the right time at the peak, and it's not going to be that way for another 50 years. Uh, it might be real estate that they sold. It might be stocks. It might be other types of financial instruments, uh, businesses. Um, uh, you know, there was a business that uh, whenever I was a, a senior executive at a, a multi-billion dollar publicly held company, they, uh, the company, they purchased a company. And it was, uh, I think it was, uh, it was between 45 and 50 million. I don't remember if it was 45, 47. Uh, I think it was just shy of 50. Um, and the guy went and bought a yacht and bought a house and bought all this stuff. It wasn't three months later and there was a law passed, which basically outlawed the very thing that he had built the business for the previous 20 years on that made it worth the company buying for $50 million. And uh, so, you know, those are the kind of things where you want to make sure you're not smart enough and neither am I. That's what we have to first acknowledge, right? We're just not. We, we can't, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know the future. We don't know what lawmakers are going to do. We don't know what new strain of COVID comes along tomorrow or what new strain of whatever new disease that shuts down the world. We don't know. The only thing we can do is trust him and obey and follow with the best we know to do today. Um, which there's plenty that we should do and be today. And that's really enough to keep all of us busy. You know, sometimes when people want to start telling me what's not right about somebody else, I'm like, hang on, I got enough wrong with me that I'm trying to, I'm just trying to do and be who I'm supposed to be today, you know, and, and speak the right things and be kind and say the right things and think the right thoughts and make the right decisions. And I mean, that's a big, this is all a big enough challenge just, trying to, that I fail at, just trying to walk the way I'm supposed to walk. But what I want to leave you with is three enemies of, uh, of success. And it's three enemies that, uh, that you have, that you may not have known that you have. Uh, the first enemy that you have, and uh, you feel it when you're building businesses, is doubt. Doubt. Doubt is a dream killer. Doubt keeps people from doing things. Doubt keeps people from starting. Doubt keeps people from growing. Uh, overthinking, <laughs> you know, when you start, uh, uh, once again, I, I think it's funny when people overthink because it's like, wow, you give yourself a lot of credit for how smart you think you are, <laughs> you know, and, and, and none of us are that smart. None of us are. And, you know, every thought you think isn't true. It's just a thought. It doesn't make it right or wrong or or, or invalid or or uh, you know the 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 level of truth to which that statement is is measured uh, by by divine standards, not by what you think or whatever. It's just a thought and that you and we're supposed to bring our thoughts into captivity. You don't just you know uh, daydream. Uh, you think with intention. But every thought you think isn't true, it's just a thought, and then you can examine it, you can evaluate it, you can uh, evaluate it against the truths that we know uh, to be true. Uh, so doubt, doubt says, I know it can be done, but I, I don't know if it can be done for you. You know, it's kind of like you say, I know you can build a big business doing X, Y, Z, but I don't know if I can be the one to build that business doing that. So it's doubt means you accept that it's possible, but you doubt if it's for you or if you are able to do it. 
and whenever we have so many examples of great success uh, all around us in, in enterprise, the doubt can sometimes be exasperated a bit because we say, we look and see that, but, but we start doubting. And we doubt when there are challenges. We doubt when, I'll tell you, when you doubt is when the results you're getting don't align with the output or with the amount of what you're doing. So for example, if you worked for eight hours and somebody paid you $80 USD, you're not going to look and go, wow, I can't believe it. I can't believe you paid me $80. You'd be like, well, you better add. I worked for eight hours for you digging ditches today. I'm sweating. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Of course. In fact, you probably should have paid me more, right? You're not going to doubt when you get paid that, that you didn't deserve it. But you do doubt if if uh, if, if your hand, if you didn't even show up to work and they give you a thousand dollars USD, you start doubting. And if they're going to pay you a thousand dollars USD for each day you don't come in, after a few days you start to wonder when is this going to stop, and you you or you doubt, uh, and so you don't get started. You don't do what's right. Um, so doubting is a is is a, is an enemy of uh, and can paralyze you uh, because doubt has killed more dreams than people ever do. You might talk about naysayers. You talk about people who who are negative, but your own thoughts is probably your worst enemy. The doubt. Well, all right, so that's doubt. Uh, the second one is distractions. The other big enemy of success is distractions. Enterprises especially get distracted. Uh, they like to focus on this and that. And, and uh, a lot of African enterprises that I had talked with uh, in the summer, you know, they, would, uh, they had equipment and reservoirs and uh, farm of this product and that product. But they wanted all new equipment for to grow a different product and this over here. And that's because they were chasing some additional revenue. Well, if we do this now, we can add an extra 30,000 USD a year to our bottom line and, you know, this and that. And so instead of growing deeper on what they're currently successful on, they look for incremental. And in business, incremental is a dirty word. It's a bad word. <laughs> incremental. Incremental revenue causes companies to lose focus. So you have to stay focused on what problem, those questions that I gave uh, our first entrepreneur, Kelly, what, what business am I in? What problem do I solve? And who owns that problem? And your answers to those, even the most established companies, some Fortune 500 companies get that answer wrong. Uh, uh, Motorola got it wrong. Um, uh, Samsung at one point got it wrong. Mercedes has gotten it wrong. I mean, several uh, big brands that are global brands have gotten it wrong. Uh, even McDonald's. They when they, but once they realized what business they were in, uh, as we discussed, then they were able to focus on growing to business they're really in, and they are a household name globally. Uh, so. Uh, and then the, so distractions, be careful. And distractions may not just be chasing after incremental revenue. Distractions can be entertainment. Distractions can be the TV. Distractions can be, uh, you know, going out uh, without it being in its proper place uh, in terms of frequency and so forth. Um, it can be a, a poor use of friends. It's just distractions. Good things can be distractions. Did you know that? When I speak of distractions, I'm not I'm not saying, you know, the obvious things that are bad or wrong. Distractions can sometimes be good things, but they're still a distraction nonetheless. Uh, and there are a few things that uh, if you went to the extreme, you could label as distractions, but I would caution you against that. Family being one, kids, children being being two, your faith, church and, and serving there number three, or actually number one, but I'm, I'm saying those are just some uh, immediate uh, areas that uh, will take you away from your business, but it is not a distraction. 
uh, even though it is time away. It is much needed time away. And quite frankly, it will make you better in business when you are grounded. Um, I have a book called Sold Out Entrepreneurship, S-O-U-L-E-D, because the world has falsely sold us a bill of goods over the last, uh, I'd say, 15, 20 years, maybe 25 years, that uh, uh, we had to be sold out, S-O-L-D, sold out, obsessed, 24-7, don't stop, don't quit, don't until it's done, sold out, S-O-L-D. Well, let me tell you that 92% of entrepreneurs and executives that have been sold out end in divorce. 92% end up divorced. Uh, they lose their families. They have broken relationships with their children. They go bankrupt. They lose, they lose everything they built because that is not the way we are instructed to live. And that uh, is the work of life. Uh, uh, putting undue priority on this is devastating in the long run. Uh, effective in the short term, devastating in the long run. Uh, so I choose to build for the long term. Uh, children, family, church, my faith, you know, those are not distractions. Those are investments, eternal investments um, that extend beyond this lifetime. And so, you know, dinner with the family, family devotions, weekly service, you know, a day of rest, these kind of things are critically uh, important. And I will say regarding rest, rest is not a prescription for the weak. It is a tonic for the strong. It is something that you can use uh, to, build your, to build up and to have strength and clarity of mind. And uh, we have divine example of, of the necessity of that. So. That is where I wanted to, to, to share with you the three enemies, doubt, distractions, which can be good things, not just bad things. They can be good things. Uh, and then the third enemy uh, that you're going to face is discouragement. And I would say that discouragement is why more entrepreneurs quit than any other thing I know. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you are young or old. Um, People can start a business at 80 years old and you can start it at five years old. Uh, I don't think that those are uh, two desperate, uh, disparate uh, age groups, but it looks different. The young entrepreneur, uh, you know, may be easily distracted. Uh, they can handle a lot more adversity without feeling it. Um, you can lose everything and it not uh, and it and it not mean anything because you had nothing. But for somebody at 60 years old who's saved and invested a lifetime of, of at a job and, and saved, and then they spend their life savings investing in their business and they lose everything, that's a very different kind of loss. Uh, it lands differently. At, at least they still have water bit. Uh, so those are the type challenges that... Uh, I mean, I mean, I don't get it. Why would you want to be in Africa? Where yeah, fuck Africa. Fuck African... <laughs> Fuck the African. Africa. Fuck, Fuck Africa. Africa. Nobody cares about Africa. Fuck you, bitch. Wow. Grab her perks. Get no, her so grab her faggot. I know that they want all this food. They ain't getting shit. They ain't getting shit today. They're not getting grub hub. They're not getting grub hub. They're not getting grub hub. It's not going to happen. They're not getting grub All right, we have uh, made <clears throat> we have made uh, Zoom aware of uh, of this intrusion, and uh, we we did admit those because we do not know who who all comes on our open calls like this, and so uh, uh, I think that just gives you a testament to the power of what we're talking about and discussing here. It cannot be stopped. The work of God cannot be thwarted. And we will be victorious. Uh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we rebuke that in Jesus' name. I, uh, so I go to the third. Uh, I say that there are three enemies, uh, doubt being the first, distractions being the second, and discouragement being the third. 
And discouragement is why people quit. Things aren't going the way you think that they should go. Or I'll tell you the biggest one in entrepreneurship is that things aren't going fast enough for you. Things aren't happening fast enough. And so it bothers you. It makes you upset. It, um, it makes you discouraged. You, you don't see a way. Building a business has never been about seeing the way. It's been about the vision. It's about doing the work you're called to do. Um, but faith is by definition not uh, that it's not in existence. So, uh, you know, that is where I, I say that we must, um, we must fight discouragement. Now, it's okay that I think a thought, but once again, if I keep thinking about that thought, then what it does is it, um, if I dwell on a wrong thought, more than just that initial thought, if I don't bring that thought into captivity quickly, then it can saturate in my mind. It can lay on my head and my brain. And, uh, and next thing you know, especially if I'm by myself, uh, I, can, I could get discouraged and I could say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I doing all of this? Why am I tired? Why am I pouring out all of this energy? Why am I doing this? And it doesn't get me what I'm looking to do. And, and so we start to get discouraged about where we are. And I'll tell you, one of the challenges is even when you're successful, discouragement often comes right after you have done something great. Uh, I, I, there are so many examples of this. I, I will just say briefly, uh, number one, I remember an Olympic gold medal gymnast who, after she set a world record, and a United States record with, with, of gold medals um, in gymnastics, uh, she entered a death spiral of discouragement. Deep, the discouragement led to a deep, dark depression. Uh, it, it makes people suicidal. And so it is, it is in that respect that, um, you know, that we realize that you have to guard against discouragement. It, uh, it is inevitable, but it is also possible that you take that and bring it into subjection the moment that the thought and the moment you start being discouraged. Elijah, after he had one of the greatest miracles on Mount Carmel, became discouraged. Um, uh, I remember after I spoke in the Great Hall of the People, in Tiananmen Square, Beijing, China. I remember after that experience, getting back to the United States and going, okay, I'm done. <laughs> now what? Like, you, how do you, you don't top that. How, how, what, what could possibly happen? What, where could you possibly be invited? Like nothing tops that. Now what? It's easy to get discouraged in those moments, because I remember thinking, I'm too young to have hit my peak now. <laughs> I mean, if I hit my peak at 40 years old, I, I, 38 or whatever, I, I, was, 30, like, I, was, I was 38 years old. I, 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 so I just had the highest you know, peak of my uh, career or success. And now I've got to live for 40 years talking about what was, that's discouraging. That's depressing. Uh, I don't want, I want to keep having things to look forward to, not constantly looking back. Uh, and so I think that is so important to recognize and to understand that, um, that discouragement comes to us all, but it is what happens when it comes to us that we either power through and propels us through that, uh, towards uh, where we're supposed to be. I think discouragement helps keep us humble. If we process discouragement properly, it goes a long way in humility. And that's what is desired for all of us. And Ms. Prisca Kimbole, I appreciate uh, 
uh, she remarked, I get discouraged and even think about selling the equipment that maybe I should not have started in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. Those are the kind of things that start to happen when things aren't going right. And I've done all this. I've invested in this. Maybe it wasn't the right way. Maybe it was the right time. Maybe I made something happen I shouldn't have made happen. And we start questioning. And, and, and some of those questions can be good um, as long as we guard it leading into the, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm out. Tapping out. Uh, it's too much. Um, that is the time where we say, I can't, but he can. We let go. We, we, we surrender to him because that, that is the, the, the power. That is, that is the place I think he wants to get us to, to where things are too big for us and we ha it has to be of him. That way we don't get all the glory. We're, we don't, we're not out there promoting us uh, and what you do or what I do. It's just doing what we're supposed to do today with what he's given us to do, uh, where he's put us to do it, and, 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 and trusting that process. That's why I can, if I live by the results, then I would be discouraged most of the time. But if I live based on, am I following the process today that he's given me to follow, then every day can be a success. Every day can be a success because it's not based on how much money you make. It's not based on how many widgets you sell. It's not based on the outcomes. It's based on, did you do and did you be who you were supposed to be? Were your words, your thoughts, your meditation, it was all of this aligned and appropriate and proper and right. And if and if the answer is yes, you're going to sleep very good tonight, knowing that the same God that took care of you today will be taking care of you and leading you tomorrow. And and when you have that level of surrender, but yet you're working diligently, you're working hard, you are moving forward, just like in events like the huddle that we have from time to time, the, this is the work. This is the work of life, is to stay doing the right thing when you don't see the results. Um, I'll close with this illustration. If every time you made a wrong decision in business, uh, or even today, if every time you made a wrong decision on how to use your time, I could give you immediate feedback that took you to success without ever deviating. It would take you to success like this, because just like a hot oven, a hot stove, if you touch a hot stove, you go, ouch. And guess what? As a child, you learn, I'm not doing that again. But life doesn't have that. So even if this is life, we've got bumper rails, we don't have the hot stove to say, nope, get back over. Nope, you're out of line, get back over. We don't have that immediate feedback in business. Sometimes we don't know if a business decision is successful for a year or 10 years. Much less, you know, I was, I was talking uh, with someone earlier today and we were looking up, the average person makes 35,000 decisions per day. 35,000 decisions a day. And I was explaining this into that's why I automate my life. I don't want to have to think about what I'm going to wear each day. I don't want to think about how I'm going to comb my hair that day. It's a waste of time and energy for me to, to, to think about hairstyles. It's a waste of time and energy for me to think about, you know, putting too much thought into, into what clothes I wear. It needs to be a system. Uh, I certainly don't want to be discussing what I'm going to have for breakfast or, uh, you know, uh, lunch or dinner or whatever. You know, I, I want those things automated because it also allows me to, my body to react and respond the same way every day. I, can, I know how I'm able to think at 9 a.m. or 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. when I get up, same as I am at maybe 10 p.m. at night. Um, I, I know how my body is react. I know how my mind is um, and, and, and how, to, how to make decisions in that. But I preserve my energy uh, for, it, for it, my capacity for making decisions. Uh, you preserve that by automating as many decisions of the smaller issues of life, the mundane issues of life, the decisions that you have to make on a regular basis, uh, you automate those. Automate where you're going to be and when you have to be there. And then you're just following your calendar. I don't have to decide every five minutes, where am I going now? Where do I, I want to go? What do I want to do? 
That sounds like freedom. But if you do that, I promise you, I'm tired by 11 a.m. whenever I do that. I'm tired because it's exhausting. Uh, but whenever it's just scheduled um, and I have standing meetings and standing appointments, then you have the energy and the capacity to do much greater work. And so that's what I wanted to just leave you with is the guard against doubt, distractions, and discouragements. Doubt, distractions, and discouragement. And I, I trust that this has been a helpful uh, huddle for you. I love helping and uh, develop African enterprises. The problems are unique. Um, and, and so we've gone through uh, strategies on specific businesses and uh, I'm most grateful for those that have attended and those that have, have been on and are watching by various means. And uh, I certainly wish, wish you the best and look forward uh, to our next uh, African huddle. God bless each of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roland. God bless you more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Many uh, thank you, doctor. We'll see you again. Thank uh, you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prescott.